For the past five years, I've been investigating this question of where good ideas come from. It's the kind of problem I think all of us are intrinsically interested in. We want to be more creative, we want to come up with better ideas, we want our organizations to be more innovative. I've looked at this problem from an environmental perspective. What are the spaces that have historically led to unusual rates of creativity and innovation? And what I've found in all of these systems, there are these recurring patterns that you see again and again that are crucial to creating environments that are unusually innovative. One pattern I call the slow hunch that breakthrough ideas almost never come in a moment of great insight, in a sudden stroke of inspiration. Most important ideas take a long time to evolve, and they spend a long time dormant in the background. It isn't until the idea has had two or three years, sometimes 10 or 20 years, to mature that it suddenly becomes accessible to you and useful to you in a certain way. And this is partially because good ideas normally come from the collision between smaller hunches so that they form something bigger than themselves. So you see a lot in the history of innovation cases of, of someone who has half of an idea. There's a great story about the invention of the World Wide Web and Tim Berners-Lee. This is a project that Berners-Lee worked on for 10 years. But when he started, he didn't have a full vision for this new medium he was going to invent. He started working on one project as a side project to help him organize his own data. He scrapped that after a couple years, and he started working on another thing. And only after about 10 years did the full vision of the World Wide Web come into being. That is, more often than not, how ideas happen. They need time to incubate, and they spend a lot of time in this partial hunch form. The other thing that's important when you think about ideas this way is that when ideas take form in this hunch state, they need to collide with other hunches. Oftentimes, the thing that turns a hunch into a real breakthrough is another hunch that's lurking in somebody else's mind. And you have to figure out a way to create systems that allow those hunches to come together and turn into something bigger than the sum of their parts. That's why, for instance, the coffee house in the Age of the Enlightenment or the Parisian salons of, of modernism were such engines of creativity because they created a space where ideas could mingle and swap and create new forms. When you look at the problem of innovation from this perspective, it sheds a lot of important light on the debate we've been having recently about what the internet is doing to our brains. Are we getting overwhelmed with an always connected multitasking lifestyle? And is that gonna to lead to less sophisticated thoughts as we move away from the slower, deeper, contemplative state of reading, for instance? Obviously, I'm a big fan of reading. But I think it's important to remember that the great driver of scientific innovation and technological innovation has been the historic increase in connectivity and our ability to reach out and exchange ideas with other people and to borrow other people's hunches and combine them with our hunches and turn them into something new. That really has, I think, been more than anything else the primary engine of creativity and innovation over the last 600 or 700 years. And so yes, it's true we're more distracted. But what has happened that is really miraculous and marvelous over the last 15 years is that we have so many new ways to connect and so many new ways to reach out and find other people who have that missing piece that will complete the idea we're working on or to stumble serendipitously across some amazing new piece of information that we can use to build and improve our own ideas. That's the real lesson of where good ideas come from the chance favors the connected mind.
People say you, you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing, and it's totally true. And the reason is, uh, is because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard, and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, if you're not having fun doing it, and you don't really love it, uh, you're going to give up. And that's what happens to most people, actually. If you really look at, 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 at the ones that uh, ended up you know, being successful, unquote, in the eyes of society and the ones that didn't, oftentimes it, it's the ones that are successful loved what they did so they could persevere when, you know, when it got really tough. And, and the ones that, that didn't love it quit because they're sane. Right? Who would want to put up with this stuff if you don't love it? So it's a lot of hard work, and, and it's a lot of worrying constantly. And uh, um, if you don't love it, you're going to fail. So you've got to love it, you've got to have passion. And I think that's the high order bit. The second thing is, um, you've got to you've gotta be a really good talent scout. Because no matter how smart you are, uh, you need a team of great people. And you've got to figure out how to, how to size people up fairly quickly, make decisions without knowing people too well, and hire them and you know, see how you do and refine your intuition and be able to, to help you know, build an organization that can eventually just you know, build itself because um, you need great people around you. Itong lugar namin, Sitio Maligaydos, San Vicente, San Pedro lang muna. Eh, siyempre, alam mo naman, ganitong lugar, squatter area, tabing rilis, dikit-dikit ang bahay. Madilim talaga rito sa lugar ko na to. Wala kami dito sa loob, lagi kami sa labas. Nadadapa kasi madilim, yung dadaan mo, hindi mo alam, may nakaharang. Tutulog na lang ako, lailaw eh. Ang tawag nila sa akin dito si Mang Dimi Solar. Napaliwanag ko yung mga bahay nila magdilim. Bubutas ka ng yero. Lalagay mo yung buti, lagyan mo siya ng silan, bago lagyan mo siya ng tubig na mineral, sa lagyan ng sundrops. Bago kabit mo sa bahay, lagyan mo silan to para hindi tumulo. Ganun lang kasimple yun. Dati yung gaito, tukadilim nung bago ko pang kapitan. Ngayon, nung kapitan ko na, ito na ang liwanag niya. Ito na ang liwanag. Pumili po ako kasi bote lang, tubig. Maliwanag na yung bahay mo. Pumaba yung ano ko, binayaran ko ngayon. Simula nung makabitan ako dito. At saka itong solar battle bag na to, hindi mainit. Dahil sa buti na yan, sa solar na buti na yan, gumanda ang araw namin. Ang nalagyan na namin ito ay bali 643. Gusto nga namin tuloy-tuloy para maraming nga matulungan mga tao rin na ano, yung maliwanag yung mga bahay nila madidilim. Parang katulad na rin ng bumbilya. Yung sa atin natin nakakalimutan at pakinabangan na ngayon.
设计师，一个设计师。I'm Mark Erickson, and this is Infinite Solutions. Don't you hate it when you go to use a flashlight or a TOS phaser only to find they have dead batteries? You'd replace them, but you can't find the type you need, be it AA or D cell. Well, in this episode, I'm going to show you how to use charged alkaline batteries of an undesired type to recharge dead batteries of the size you need. Electric currents run from anode to cathode. That's why batteries are arranged with their opposite poles adjacent. On items that have inverted batteries, their orientation is on account of interior wiring that serves to connect the batteries in the way I've just described. That's why you never see a portable gaming system or a remote with double A's running parallel. But if you invert the batteries so their positive terminals are connected, capacitance from the charged battery will flow into the uncharged one. The trick is to mirror the output magnitude so the transfer can take place. And to do that, you need to know the impedance ratios. For instance, 2 AA equals 1 C, meaning 2 AA's can recharge 1 C battery. Orient them as shown here and secure with electrical tape. It's called electrical tape because it conducts electricity. Leave them for approximately 24 hours. The charge will flow from the C battery into the AA's until the counterflow of capacitance equalizes. At this point, all batteries will be charged equally. You can then replace any or all batteries on one side of the equation to repeat the procedure and recharge the opposite side further. A dead battery can never be fully recharged. To reduce charging time, you can apply a mildly acidic catalyst to the terminals beforehand. This speeds the chemical reaction. This works with any battery type. Pause the screen if you need to. Line bolts are tricky to orient because both terminals are on the same side. I hope you found this interesting. I'm Mark Erickson and this is Infinite Solutions. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, 
the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them, because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do.